Hello everybody, it is God Blacksburg here, CEO at Wolf, and I am so excited to be talking with the team from Starfighters. We are here at NASA. This is amazing at the Kennedy Space Center, and I've had the opportunity now to watch a jet take off, do a couple of passes, get my mind slightly blown, and now to talk with your team about everything that this company is doing. Gonna start off with yourself, Rick. I would love for you to give just a quick background to somebody who's unfamiliar with this company. In, in a one minute synopsis, what makes this so exciting and where is the opportunity? Well, most, mostly makes this operation exciting is Mach 2 jet fighters that we're sitting around right now. Um, nobody has these uh, and they're a unique, um, exciting, and even though he says not good to say next sexy on NASA, but it's a very sexy vehicle. And that's what makes people excited because number one, it's for real. You saw it fly today. It's not something we're, we're making up. We're not developing it, but it's, it's the most unique airplane and capable operation, operational vehicle to get us to that next step, actually launching rockets into low Earth orbit. Let's talk about this next step, right? It's, it's cool to see it fly around here, but that's not what you're building them for, right? You are building them for a purpose, and that is to deliver these payloads to space, which is a rapidly developing economy. And when you look at the chart, it's obvious, right? Last year was by far the most items ever launched, and there's a little bit of monopoly going on in that space right now that maybe you guys want to get your, your hands into. So Tim, talk to me about the opportunity here that lies for others to break in this industry and, and what you project is going to happen over these next five years. Sure. So the big opportunity is the lower end of the market uh, for small payloads. Everyone has either moved up to larger payloads or they've failed. So we're all by ourselves right now at the small payloads. Uh, we're going to call them super light. So it's about half the size of small satellites down. and. Uh, that's a huge opportunity because it's been ignored or they have to wait their turn on a big rocket, which they can wait 18 months. They don't necessarily go to the orbit they want to go to. They, they are, run the risk of uh, the larger carrier on the, uh, on the rocket slowing them up. So there's a huge opportunity for that. Um, our, our projections are very much, and I, not to take anything of David's thunder, but we're following a classic model for space, which is relatively new, and that's the Elon and Rocket Lab, the SpaceX and Rocket Lab model of fly once a quarter, once a month, twice a month, four times a month, and see where you go from there. So we're very um, scalable, and we're following the, the recently established uh, method for doing that. Yeah, it's very cool that you have a roadmap to follow along here, right? A bit of a proven roadmap. It did blow my mind a little bit when I hear about these satellites. And as, as a person who, you know, before going into this, I think most of us in my generation, we think satellites are these massive, right, orbiting things. When we're talking, this is a sub 100 pounds, right? Yes. So that, that just is mind blowing to me. Is this also a big bet on those continuing to get smaller, maybe being able to take up multiple of them? How, how do these flights work and where could this potentially get to? So I just the other day completed the chart. So there are certain payloads where we could fly 12 of them or just one of them. So that gives you an idea of the payloads from one to 12. We're, we're trying to get six more pounds to fly 16. We're going to be working on that. Uh, so, but uh, satellites uh, in 2020 were four times smaller than they were in 1980, just to give you a sense of scale from okay. 1980 to uh, 2020. In 40 years, they, they're four times smaller. So, and, you know, the, and we're even looking at satellites that have like electronics as structure, so they're even going to get smaller. So yes, we see that happening for a while. Yeah, it makes sense to me. So let's talk a little bit about the numbers here, as that's largely what I think my audience likes to pay attention to when they're considering investment. You're raising 35 million currently at a $65 million valuation. This is a, a potential $400 billion industry uh, right now when you look at the numbers. Walk me through, and you've raised in the past, a little bit over 8 million, about 8.5 million. Walk me through what's been done with the money that has been raised already what the current raise is for, and then we'll get into a little bit of the other numbers. Yeah, I mean, I mean, first and foremost, I think you you really nailed sort of the crux of what we're trying to do here. And um, there is a monopoly in space right now, um, obviously, uh, needless, needless to say, it's SpaceX. 80% um, of all satellites launched last year were SpaceX and Starlink. So there's a tremendous opportunity here to grab some of that market share. Um, and that's what we're really trying to achieve. So. In terms of the raise, um, a lot of it to date has been R&D, acquiring some of our fleet, uh, building out engines, um, and then of course the biggest news is building our rocket with GE Aerospace. 
uh, which will be complete this year and, and hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, with our first launch by the end of this year. Oh. Oh, our first suborbital rocket. Suborbital, not, yeah. Not our big rocket. Yeah, and there's a few things in regards to Orbit and LEO that I really want to touch yeah. on because those really stood out to me. But before I do get to them, uh, let's talk a little about the numbers. So right now, big question for any investor, how does this company make money? And what, what does that look like so far up to this point from as much as you can share within yeah. the financial details? And what's your projections moving forward? I mean, the good news is uh, with, the amount of money we're, with the money we're raising right now, um, you know, when we started this raise, it was just before you saw all those space companies go crazy over the last 12 months. So if you get in right now, you're going to take advantage of some of that natural uh, lift that we're going to we're going to see, I believe, in the next six to 12 months. Um, so 65 million pre money. It's about 150 post money. Mm -hmm. uh, once we start generating revenue from Star Launch One and Star Launch Two, um, I could see that easily being a 10x. You know, once we start launching into space, um, you know, I really believe that it's a million, uh, a billion market cap minimum for a launch capable company, public company. Do you have any projections on? road to profitability and in regards to revenue, what those revenue numbers could look like, or does a lot of it lie on partnerships and formations and other things? Um, so, I mean, the good news with our company is the cadence, our ability to, to launch quickly uh, and often really sets us apart from a lot of the larger space companies you're seeing like SpaceX and Rocket Lab. Um, we obviously have our hangar here at Kennedy Space Center, but we're also building out at Midland 150,000 square foot state-of-the-art spaceport and we're also looking at other areas too where we can have multiple launch sites um, as tim alluded to uh, once you know we get our first launch out the door we'll be following the elon methodology of going from one launch a quarter one launch a month to basically one or two launches every single week from multiple spaceports so um, i believe that we'll be profitable and cash flow positive sometime in mid 2027. wow yeah, appreciate the yeah. projections there and some of the details. Flip back to yourself real quick. I mean, obviously, I, I love talking over these numbers pieces, but there's there's a lot more to it than just the money in an industry like this. Uh, what goes into it that really brings everything together? I know Austin was talking with you before, and he said you have to be a dreamer, right? So, what are people in this for beyond the money? That's number one. It's the uniqueness where we are and what we're operating. I mean, this is something that I'm. Um, like my maintenance guys, you know, they could go work on Cessnas or maybe go work on an airliner or something like that, or work on a supersonic jet fighter. And um, they fell into the niche of saying, supersonic jet fighter at Kennedy Space Center is pretty cool. Yeah. And now that they do it, they're in love with it. It's become, it's become cultural for them. So um, our guys are, are uh, Sean has been with us now for 25 years. Wow. And uh, we expect that our, our team is going to be long term. It's not, we don't have, much of a turnover here because we're small. And as we expand, we expect most of these people will stick with us as well because we are such a unique operation. And um, I, th I think it's, again, it's the sex appeal of what we have. And the fact that we're, we're not a, a talking group, we're, we're, a, we're doers. I mean, we're capable of everything we say we're, we're, we're talking about. Um, that's a uniqueness in this industry in itself, to be honest with you. Yeah, that's the most intriguing thing to me, right? When you look at it, you're not a corporate businessman, right? You're someone that's been doing this for almost twice as long as I've been alive, <laughs> right? And you've been flying and you've been in the, the, the seat, right? Uh, in the midst of it. So who better to do it? The last thing I wanted to touch on real quick was Leo. If you could explain to people sure. what that means, sure. what the value is there. So, so our, our, our first uh, rocket just goes suborbital. So it will go up about probably 250 miles and back down. I'll probably have 10 to 15 minutes of microgravity. You can do a lot of tests in that. And it doesn't require all the energy to go into orbit. So you can get some, but that's rather limited. LEO stands for a low Earth orbit. And it's where most of the satellites are today because of constellations such as Starlink. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's so, it moves over the Earth. It's usually an average 400, 800 miles. And it keeps moving. The Earth rotates, and they're not at geosynchronous, which is which is way up. About 25,000 where satellite stays in the same spot. So there's a lot of traffic there. There's a lot of uh, satellites there, and they're used basically for all the same five reasons: imagery, communication, and and uh, and so forth. Um, and it is where both NASA, the U.S. Defense Department, they really want to commercialize Leo. 
Um, it is a policy of the United States to commercialize Leo. Um, and, uh, and the big stuff's left to NASA to go to Mars and things like that. So, so it's in the federal policy to commercialize. And now, now that we're getting more airliners, it needs to be more than SpaceX and Rocket Lab and Blue Origin and get some smaller players in there. That will be diverse like the uh, airline industry. So, but there's a real Absolutely. opportunity for the, for, the smaller, for the smaller players. Yeah, I love it. I know I need to wrap up, but I encourage people that are watching to go ahead and do your research by doing a couple of simple things. First, just look at the chart on demand for launches into space and people sending things into space and you're gonna look at it and say, okay, I'm still early, right? Because it's massively grown, but nowhere near where it's going to be in a decade from now. So look at that demand and understand if you have that much demand, you're going to need more supply and you're gonna need it regularly, you're gonna need it often, or you need it affordably. Uh, outside of that, I recommend that you get right to the page that I'm going to link below this interview. It's going to have all the information and details for you to really research the company. We really just touched on, I think, some of the, the fundamentals and the revenue, but I didn't even touch on the fact that there's a massive, massive charge from the U.S. to stay ahead of China and other areas in this industry as well. So you've got an industry that the U.S. desperately wants to be successful combined with massive demand. You do the math. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate all your time. Thank, Thank you. you.